Holy Spirit, and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts risk something big for something good in a world too small for anything but love. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I've often heard that it's difficult to make friends as an adult, especially in Minnesota. (laughs) But when I met Richard, we became fast friends. Or I should say that he was the fast friend and I was the slow friend because I met Richard on a treadmill. (laughs) And the more that we talked, swapping war stories and old glories, the sort of things that people in their 40s do in overpriced gyms in the suburbs, the more we realized that we had similar backgrounds. Oh, you played high school football? I played high school football. Wait, you played football in college? I played basketball in college. Now granted, this was a few years ago. But as this friendship grew, I started to get the feeling that maybe Richard and I didn't exactly have the same experiences. And it was little things like learning he still holds the record for punt return yardage at a Division I college. Or when he would casually drop information like, well, when I was in training camp with the Green Bay Packers. So let's just say that I stopped bragging about athletic achievements. And I ran a lot harder on the treadmill. Now, all joking aside, over the past few years of our friendship, we've grown. And our friendship has developed beyond the the tall tales of sports and into deeper stuff of actual relationships. And it's, it's the sort of friendship that unfortunately leads to jokes. Because as a culture, We're not used to people, especially men, having any sort of intimacy with one another. Friendship, if we want to believe culture, is to stop short of anything beyond high fives and barbs about receding hairlines and expanding waistlines, and all of which are only to occur on the occasional boys' night out, where of course you will be having beer and wings. So when we're confronted by intimacy in the world, we're often unable to process it. And too often, that intimacy becomes fodder for boring innuendo. Because we haven't been taught how to see two friends having dinner. And we haven't been able to process it in a way other than joking about two friends going out to have a date night. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with two men going on a date, so please hear me say that loudly and clearly, especially on a Sunday when one of the propers is this particular reading from Genesis. But even in that reading, which is too often wrongly interpreted as sexual rather than relational, We're hearing a story that at its root is deeply intimate. Abraham is talking to the holy, to God. And depending on how you read the story, there's a scene of either bargaining or one of Abraham appealing to God's better nature. Abraham draws near and he begins to speak to God. Now, this is a stark difference from the cautious and perhaps even subservient Abraham that we see and come to know in the previous passages of of Genesis. The verb that's used right before in these stories is, uh, in this story actually, is meant to invoke a legal argument. It's meant to be adversarial. We're supposed to realize that this isn't the same Abraham. He wants to know how many innocent people will stop God. Writer Nora Gallagher speaks of the scandal of the particular when reading this passage. The scandal of the particular is the idea that God, the enormous creative force that that hung the stars and created the Leviathan just for the sport of it, also has the capacity to care about one particular singular human sparrow, the tiniest uh, life. 
It's a lowbrow God when you compare it to that of the Greeks and perhaps the ivory-towered institutions of our own seminaries and divinity schools. And it's scandalous because it forces us to, to think about our theologies, to make them accountable to the people who are sitting next to us in the pews today, to think about the people we cross on, pass on the streets. And of this scandal, Gallagher writes, and here in the Genesis story, we also have Abraham reminding God that the story of salvation is the story of single human beings. Abraham persuades God to stay his hand on behalf of the few. They haggle down to ten who are still righteous. God was ready to be just, to punish the wicked. Abraham reminds God to be merciful. Now, there's an audacity to reminding God to do anything. To, there's an audacity to raising your hand to, at, to just tell God anything. To even consider drawing close to God, if I'm being honest. To do so requires a relationship. And it's one that not only requires knowing the character of God, but it's one that trusts the relationship. It's one that knows that that relationship is built on generosity and, and confidence. And it's one that knows that no matter what the request, no matter how absurd, it's not going to be met with malice. So Abraham can step forward. He can raise his hand and he can draw near. Now, across all of Scripture, my favorite parts always come in the Gospels when we get a peak of intimacy between the, the disciples and Jesus. Unfortunately, more often than not, these have to be sifted through the stories when the disciples are arguing about who's going to sit where, or perhaps they're trying to stumble through an answer to a qu question that Jesus has just asked them. And today's gospel reading is one of those moments of, of intimacy, I think. It's the disciples coming up to Jesus in this certain place, and they're saying, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And like so many other times, I think the disciples are both being swept away by their love of Christ, the fervor just simply being around him, and at the same time completely unaware of what they're actually asking Jesus to give them. Because Jesus is about to hit them with a prayer that even today, to invoke the words of Annie Dillard, should have us all showing up to this church wearing crash helmets. Because too often, I think we read this passage at the surface level. We read it as if the disciples just showed up and said, Hey, Jesus, got any prayers laying around? And Jesus pulls one out of his sleeve, unrolls the scroll, and says, Here is the Lord's Prayer. And the fact that it's followed by the ask, seek, and knock passage makes it ready-made for preachers such as myself who are looking for a three-point sermon for, with practical takeaways. And in fairness, I have to confess that when I first was told that I was asked if to preach today, I thought, oh, perfect. I'm going to use my first cathedral preaching uh, to talk about ask, seek, and knock as a map for my new role as the cradle-to-career associate. But then the Holy Spirit and my friend Jayan got involved, and here we are. I would never fault a preacher, though, for looking to make Scripture practical. But when I read these passages, I'm not sure or convinced that Jesus was looking to give the disciples a simple or an easy prayer program. Instead, I think he was introducing them to another deeper step in their relationship with the God of generosity and confidence, the God who welcomed Abraham forward. It's the same God who asks us to risk our own vulnerabilities our own absurd questions, and acknowledges how difficult it is to ask and to seek and to knock in a world that more often than not does not value intimacy or vulnerability. Because asking and seeking and knocking fundamentally means that we do not have what we need. It means that we require something that is outside of ourselves. Ourselves. 
that we require something more than we can provide for ourselves. And because the world doesn't value it, we never get to practice what we need. We are never told to value the opportunity to sit with a friend and to hold their hand as their mother is dying. Or to tell them that, yes, they deserve to be happy in a world that is falling apart. We let our friendships stay at shallow depths for fear of being seen as needy or for feeling embarrassed for seeming weak. And because we never get this practice, when we sit in the pews of a church and we hear a message like this, when we hear propers like this, a call to vulnerability and intimacy, we have no choice but to think, well, how am I supposed to do that? I have no idea how to do that. So friends, hear me say this. It's risky to ask for what we need. It's risky to seek out intimacy. It's risky to knock on a door that we're not sure is going to be answered. But the good news is that the risk is never a risk with God. The answer from God is always yes. And it doesn't make it easier right now. But perhaps part of the prayer that we learned today or that the disciples learned was that God's will on earth as it is in heaven is a slow transformation of turning what looks like risk into something that looks more like practice. And that practice becomes something that over time allows us to draw a little nearer to God and perhaps a little closer to one another as well. Now, in closing, I had a chance to have dinner with Richard last week, just before he was leaving to attend his mother's funeral in Texas. And like usual, we met for, cliche or not, beer and wings. And he walked me through the words he was planning for her to say for her eulogy. And toward the end, I, I asked his permission to, to tell some of these stories during the sermon. And he kind of did a double take and he said, wait, what? You're going to preach about me? And he said, well, about us, you know, our friendship and intimacy. About the time I beat you in that mile run at Orange Theory that one time. And it made him laugh for the first time that night and in a couple weeks. And he paused and he said, well, you better tell him about the Packers too. And on that note, amen. <laughs>